you know, we started the flight into downtown Baghdad. And I remember as we flared over the target building, seeing the charges go on the first floor from the ground assault floors. And I thought, we are the greatest nation in the world. Like, what would you do if you were on the receiving end of this? You have helos full of commandos descending on you from above. You have vehicles full of commandos hitting you from the ground floor. Like, how could anyone deal with this? And it stuck with me. There were a lot of those moments, but like that one in particular, because it was broad daylight, which didn't happen a lot. Um, and the timing was absolutely perfect. And I just thought there's nobody that does this but us. And it really stayed with me. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we hear the combat story of Chris Van Sant a retired Army infantryman, Ranger, Green Beret, and operator in 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta, or Delta Force. Chris survived 11 combat deployments and hundreds of combat operations across multiple theaters. As you can imagine, after so many years at the tip of the spear, Chris ended up confronting and overcoming traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. He remains a committed veteran and advocate, helping others through these tough times. He's now the Chief Operating Officer of TYR Tactical, which manufactures body armor and tactical equipment for the military and law enforcement. He's also a board member for Tom and Jen Satterley's All Secure Foundation. This is a two-part interview. Chris had a storied career in combat and had to overcome so much afterwards. We felt it was important to spend adequate time on both the combat and what came next, particularly today as so many vets and hard chargers confront these same issues. Chris is very humble given all his achievements and success And I know you'll enjoy his combat story as much as I did. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp provides global online professional counseling and therapy that allows you to connect securely with the counselor over chat, video, or phone. As I've mentioned on Combat Story, as have many of my guests, we tend to deal with the lingering psychological effects of combat and stress. I've used professional counselors for years to help navigate these difficult times, and I'm glad that I did. I recently used BetterHelp for this, in fact, and found it an easy, convenient, and cost-effective way to get the mental health support I needed. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And what's great is that you can start communicating within 48 hours. For me, this took less than 24 hours. I'm also trying BetterHelp for professional coaching in addition to stress-related counseling, which is something I've been looking for but never quite found a convenient remote option that would fit my schedule. I know for many, the idea of counseling is not something we want to talk about, but I hope that hearing the stories of these veterans and their decision to seek professional support will encourage others to do the same. What's great is that Combat Story listeners get a special offer of 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash combat story. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash combat story. Chris, thanks for joining the show and taking the time to share your story. Hey, I appreciate you having me anytime. So I, I wanted to kick off with something that I noticed on your uh, Instagram page, which describes you as a climber, hiker, world traveler. And yep. if if your military career is anything, any indication, I'm imagining it's not uh, low scale, low impact climbing and hiking. So uh, I wonder if you could kick us off with one or two of your favorite hikes, climbs, maybe one of the more dangerous ones. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So most memorable, um, uh, I got lucky. Uh, I, I met a person that, um, fell in love and became passionate with something that I'm passionate about, which is being in the outdoors. Um, my wife, Robin. So, uh, I introduced her to that, um, not long after we met and, and she loved it. And, uh, when I was getting ready to retire from the military, she said, you know, what's something you've always wanted to do? Cause we had had a conversation about like, what are you going to do in transition, um, before you move on to career number two. And I said, uh, you know, I always wanted to hike the Appalachian trail or the PCT or something like that. Um, we ended up settling on the John Muir trail. Um, John Muir to this day, you know, it's, it's 226 miles or something like that. You start in Yosemite national park and you finish on the summit of Mount Whitney, um, you cross through three national parks, you know, Yosemite, Sequoia and Kings Canyon. Um, a lot of it in John Muir wilderness. It's just, 
every day is absolutely incredible. Um, and it's, it's for us, it was 21 days straight, uh, two resupplies along the way. Uh, I joke around, I say all the time, I'm like, I'm like long distance, like through hiking or a climbing trip for that matter, or just like planning a military operation. Like you've got logistics, you've got resupply, you've got where you're going to sleep. You know, what do you do in inclement weather? What are your contingency plans? Um, so all that stuff is very cathartic and, and I've always enjoyed it, but we did John Muir right after I retired as, as kind of like, a I don't know, a, a, a line where, uh, this is what I used to do and I'm moving on to the next thing. And it was absolutely incredible, man. It was one of the best experiences of my life. Um, I, I healed on that trip. Like it, it gave you time to focus on thinking about the past and then focusing on the future. It gave me time to deal with some issues. Um, it gave some clarity of thought with no distraction, um, that allowed me to process a lot of the stuff that had happened over the course of my career, both good and bad. Um, so John Muir is definitely one that stands out. Uh, it's the longest hike that we've done to date. Um, but at this point, I'm now six years post-retirement. We've, we've hiked all over the world. Um, we just got back from, uh, the Waiwash Trek in Peru. Um, and spent about nine days in the Peruvian wilderness there in the Andes. Um, and that was incredible. But, uh, number two would be, um, so I, I got her into the back country and the next step was Alpine mountaineering. Um, I've always had a goal of doing the seven summits. Uh, ideally it would be with, with someone else, um, not just myself. Um, so my wife and I have started doing bigger stuff. Uh, and the first real big one, we've done a lot of 14 ers and stuff in the U S but nothing really Alpine, um, Fourteeners is like 14,000 feet. Yes. Yeah. And so a lot of those in the U S a lot of people do that. That's a big thing. Um, at the end of the day, it's kind of a small mountain. Uh, it's big in the U S but it's small globally. Um, so the first sort of bigger mountain that we did was, um, uh, in Mexico, it was, uh, Orizaba, which is the tallest volcano in North America. Um, and Pico de Orizaba was, it, it, it's just a grueling climb. Uh, it's not super te technical, but you, you know, you do cross the glacier and you are roped up, um, and it's, it's, you know, a pretty steep angle, crampons, ice axes, the whole nine yards and finishing that mountain with someone that you, that you love and you care about, um, was kind of a huge milestone for both of us. Uh, and that sense of satisfaction for me, it's akin to like a successful military operation when you set out to do something and then you achieve that goal. And no one gets hurt, no one gets injured, and you do it according to plan. Uh, and then you come home. Um, it's just really, really mentally rewarding. And so that kind of started the bug. So since then, um, we did Cotopaxi uh, and about four other summits in Ecuador last year. Um, and then uh, we were supposed to do um, Mount Elbrus in Russia this summer, but because of COVID restrictions and travel stuff, that didn't happen. El Elbrus would, would have been the first of the seven summits. Um, so instead we're going to, we're going to do Aconcagua in January. Um, so we're, we're kind of bumping up to, <laughs> to pretty high, but um, you know, the, between the Cotopaxi trip, Cotopaxi is like 19.5. And then where we just were in Peru, we basically stayed above 13,000 feet for nine straight days. Um, the highest pass was about 16.5. So we're ready to go do it. Um, so we're going to do Aconcagua in January and then kind of continue to tick them off. So, uh, probably do Kilimanjaro cause that's a relatively easy one. Um, and then hopefully get back to Elvis and Russia and then kind of progress from there. So I don't know if we'll do them all together. I don't know if I'll get my wife convinced to do, uh, Vincent in Antarctica or, or Everest, but, um, my goal is to accomplish those before I'm, I'm physically unable to do so. So while I'm, while I still got enough gas in the tank, I'm going to give it a shot. Damn. Are you doing these with guides or? Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, I should plug them. I, I did. We randomly booked a trip with mountain gurus, which is a, a international climbing guide company. Um, and a guy named Teresa Sylvester that's, a on the side, he's a professional photographer. Um, but he's a, a mountain guide. His father is a legend in Yosemite climbing and climbed a bunch of routes first and stuff that nobody's ever done. And, Tere is a fantastic climber. He's a really good dude. And my wife and I are both about connection. So if you climb with a guy and you like him and you all get along and you learn to understand each other, why wouldn't you stick with that? So 
he actually summited Everest um, for the first time just this past year. Um, but he and his company guide all seven summits. So, uh, you know, if luck holds, we'll, we'll probably end up doing all of them with him. Just, just out of curiosity, is that something, if you're, if you're looking to do the seven, are you planning to do those in a, in a certain time frame? Like you want to knock them out in two years. So your body's acclimated and prepared, or is this like, as you have a chance, you might knock it out in 10 years. Yeah, no, no, there's no time goal at all. Um, it's about being ready and being acclimated and prepared. Um, I, I still have that, like that old stubborn militariness in me in that I don't do enough preparation for an event and I go do it and it sucks way worse than it should. Um, so we're trying to be a little bit smarter about that. Um, I tend to punish myself a little bit, but, but yeah, we're, we're no time frame. We're going to do them as, as they sort of make sense. Um, Aconcagua, we were looking at doing a while ago, but it was supposed to happen post Elbrus in Russia. Uh, and then Elbrus fell through. So we, we pulled the Peru, the Peru trip out, um, because we wanted to do something high altitude, but do a long distance hike instead of a climb. Um, and so it kind of sets us up perfect. So we'll go right back down to South America. It's like a three week trip. I mean, they do a really good job in acclimating you and preparing you and going progressively higher each day. So it's, it's slower than I would do it by choice, but it's probably the smart way to do it. Awesome. So this is really interesting. So Robin must be a very, very forgiving forgiving person to, to all of a sudden fall in love with not just the outdoors, but like climbing these summits. I just interviewed um, an Australian SAS guy, Mark Wales, who was on Australian Survivor, met his wife, and then was on the Eco Challenge in Fiji, like world's toughest race with her. Yeah. And honest to God, I could never, like my wife would never do that with me. So that's pretty cool. You guys are doing that. I tell you what, yeah, I mean, she's a fit person and takes good care of herself. Uh, and she's a couple of years younger than me. Um, but, uh, I tell her all the time. She, I don't think she, she laughs and doesn't understand. Cause I met her sort of at the very end, like the last couple of years of my career. So she didn't know me when I did any of those things. She didn't know any of my coworkers or anything like that. Um, and started later on in life. And I tell her all the time, I'm like, I know SF dudes that can't do the stuff that you've done. Like, <laughs> When we hiked John Muir and we were standing on the summit of Whitney, I said, you just hiked 226 miles in 21 days. That's 10 miles a day plus. And, you know, at each resupply, she was at about 30, 35 pounds. Like, like that's, that is substantial. I, 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 I know guys that were professional operators that would struggle with that, um, without a lot of preparation and you crushed it. And that's pretty cool. Um, now I'm, you know, I'm all old and broken. So she's, she's my motivator. She's the one that says, you know, what are we going to go do next? So nice. it's, it's a good balance. That's cool. All right. Well, I want to, I want to use this to talk about, um, growing up a little bit, but I can't pass up the fact that you just described these people as coworkers, which is funny in this context. Cause I think of coworkers as like an office environment and I'm imagining like Shrek as a coworker in that context, which is, it just makes me smile anyway. So you, you mentioned, as you were talking, you, you had always kind of been into the outdoors. Like, is this from early childhood? Did you just spend time outside? Did your parents take you out? Like, what was, what was your connection to the outdoors? Uh, yeah. I mean, not a ton. I mean, I grew up in Delaware. Um, I literally born and raised in Dover, Delaware. There's Delaware is like one of the flattest States in the country. So it's not very mountainous. Um, we did used to drive up to the Poconos a lot and go skiing when I was younger. And then as I got older and had a driver's license and stuff, I used to spend most winters, you know, running up there on weekends. So I kind of grew up skiing and loved skiing. I always loved the mountains. Maybe that's part of growing up in a flat state. You know, you're just sort of drawn to it, but then my military career exposed me to a lot more. Um, you know, later on in my special operations career, I, you know, I was on a climbing team and we did some trips and things and, uh, you know, did some ice climbing, did whatever, you know, just training, but they were good trips. And I learned a lot of stuff and realized I'm fairly decent at it and, and I really enjoy it. Um, and then it wasn't until later on that I realized like just how healing the outdoors can be. Like, uh, my wife and I have a saying, like they, the back country is our church is what we say all the time. And it's, there's a spirituality that goes with being out there isolated alone. 
Um, and at the same time, there's a spirituality that goes with pushing yourself uh, kind of to the limit to accomplish some of those things. And then at the same time, knowing when to, to back off. So uh, yeah, man, it's like, it's, it's 50% of who I am these days and, and keeps me sane. And then growing up in Delaware, what, what was the connection for you to the military? When did that enter your mind? Um, it was, it was a myriad of things, but you know, I always tell people, I think the biggest now looking back, the biggest contributor was my, my grandfather, my mom's dad. Um, both my, both my grandfather's mom and dad's side were, were, were two veterans and my mom's dad, I was closer to, um, and I was the youngest of all the grandchildren. Um, so I got my grandfather at a really good point in his life. Like, you know, you get older and you mellow. So some of the older grandkids, you know, he never talked a lot about anything, but by the time I got him, uh, it was when he was mentally ready to start telling stories from his past. And for me as a kid growing up, listening to him, I was absolutely fascinated. And I reflecting on it now, I like, even when he told a sad story, which it was like 50, 50, some of them were happy. Some of them were sad, but whenever he told a story, he told it with such reverence, like he was an old man and he remembered it as vibrant as if it was yesterday. And he told it to me like that as a child, but probably much to my mother's dismay, <laughs> but you know, he shared a lot of things. And I think that just captured my attention. I was like, man, if, if this man could spend four years fighting for his country overseas, and when he reflects on it all these years later, it's all so positive. How could this be a bad thing? And I think that is what really built the draw. And then, and then, you know, the obvious stuff was we grew up in the movie age and there was a lot of really good movies when we were kids. <laughs> Which were the movies for you? I always oh, yeah, find this you know, fascinating. Yeah. People always ask that. I mean, jokingly, I always say like the Chuck Norris, Lee Marvin Delta Force movie is one of my faves. The, the Navy SEALs movie with Charlie Sheen and Michael Bain. Uh, you know, they were just cool flicks. Um, and you know, whatever they glamorize that whole thing. But, but you combine that with stories from World War II that we all have an impression of being some of the most difficult times that anyone has ever lived through. And to hear your grandfather tell it so strongly, like, so like, it's just such a part of who he is and he's, you know, 75 years old. Like that, that was just, I think that combination is what really sold it for me. Um, so yeah, I, I, most of that I attribute to my grandfather. Uh, that's really cool. Do you, was he, he was in Europe for, for the fighting? Uh, he was actually in the South Pacific for most of his time. Um, he was in the army air Corps. So it was pre air force. Uh, and he was, uh, I don't know, I guess an RTO for lack of a better term, but he dealt with airfield. So when they would move to a new Island and establish an airhead, um, he would, deal with the airfield and a lot of that stuff. So he bounced around, you know, he had great stories out of Australia, Papua New Guinea, and a lot of the islands in the South Pacific and uh, just interesting stuff for a guy that was in the army air Corps. Um, drastically different than the path I chose, but, but it, it was enough to spark my interest. Man. And then, so for your folks, did either of them, and it sounds like your mom probably didn't, well, you described it, but did, did your old man end up serving? My father did. He, um, so let's see, you're talking mid to late sixties. Um, so Vietnam was still going on. My dad was one of those people that, and, and he said this, he was like, I was either going to get drafted or I was going to volunteer. Um, and he and my mom had just had a baby. They just had my brother. Uh, and my dad decided to enlist in the national guard. He thought, well, I'm in college. I have a baby. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do my part enlisted in the national guard and then never actually ended up in Vietnam. So, uh, you know, he took that step, which he felt like was the right thing to do, which always stuck with me. Um, but never ended up having to go over, which, you know, thankfully for him. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. So, so you're watching the movies, you hear from your grandfather, you kind of see, see your dad, your dad's path. Um, at, at what point was it in high school? You're like, all right, I'm, I'm going to go in and do this thing. Or did it come later? No, no, it was pretty early. Uh, my, I was a mess as a kid. Um, what, what does that mean? What, what I, do you mean? I, you know, I, I didn't have a bad upbringing. My, my parents got divorced when I was very young, um, but they both remarried and they both remarried great people. So I like the, I, I make a joke of it, but I ended up with 
two good families instead of one. <laughs> um, so, you know, it wasn't tough, you know, you go through ups and downs when you go through a divorce. So you, you know, you're middle-class and then things are tough when it's two brothers and a mom, and then they both remarry and then life gets better. So I don't, you know, there's nothing, there's no big drama there or anything, but, um, you know, as Delaware, there's not a lot to do. And, and back then getting in trouble was something to do. So, you know, we, we drank at an early age and you didn't really get in trouble back then. You know, if you got stopped by the police, they called your parents cause it's Delaware and everybody knows everybody. Um, so we could kind of get away with a lot. Um, so I was a drinker at a way too young age. Um, by the time I was a sophomore in high school, I was getting in a lot of trouble. I was drinking and I was acting up in class. Um, I was one of those kids where if I was interested in the subject, I was like, I was a history guy. I would get, you know, straight A's in history classes, um, math I hated and it was boring or English or whatever. And I would do terrible cause I would act up cause I was bored. Um, so about midway through my sophomore year, I was not in a good place. I was drinking a lot. Um, so about my junior year, uh, my junior year was the first time I got told if you don't get certain grades, you can't play sports. Uh, and that for me was a little bit of an eye opener because I really enjoyed athletics and, you know, I was a baseball player and I live for that. Like I live for summer ball. I really wanted to play in high school. Um, so that was the first time that it impacted me. Um, and that was when I started thinking about, you know, am I going to, am I going to go to college after this? Am I not, what am I going to do? And I had a kid in class with me that who's, ironically, whose brother was a combat controller, was a air air force combat controller. Um, and CCT guys and PJs have a really cool pipeline. And if someone just hands you like the document of this is the CCT or PJ pipeline, and you're a kid that grew up watching, you know, the Navy SEAL movie and the Chuck Norris Delta force movie, it sounds like the coolest thing ever. Like literally I'm going to join the service and you're going to let me jump out of planes and send me to dive school. And I'm going to do all these things like this sounds amazing. And that, I think that piqued my interest. Um, and then, you know, as school went on, uh, I, I, I think I had a little bit of an awareness of if I went to college, I'm going to party and drink and I'm not going to do well. Um, so as much as I wanted to go, my dad was a college baseball coach too at the time. Oh, wow. So I, I really like baseball was in my blood. And I really wanted to go play college baseball, but I knew I would mess it up. Um, so I really started seriously looking at the military end of my sophomore year, junior year. And then uh, I thought, you know, there, there's a lot of avenues here and there's some things that appeal to me. Um, so maybe I'll give that a shot. And it's really interesting, you know, not having heard the rest of your story, but to have done what what you have, what you go on to do, it would seem like you have some pretty strong self-discipline, but the way you're describing it is no, not really, unless it's something I really enjoy. Right. I mean, does that come later for you? The, uh, the no, I think, I mean, I think I was always an individual. Um, I think even growing up, you know, there's whatever, especially in a small town, there's clicks and people do this. I was always that guy that was his own person and did his own thing and found his own way and fit in sort of everywhere. So, uh, yeah, I think I, I think I always felt like I could do whatever I wanted. Um, yeah. and that's not, that wasn't confidence. That was just, I'm just me and uh, I'm going to give it a shot. And if I fail, I fail. I'll either try again or I'll move on to something else. And I don't know. I don't know when I found that. Um, I really don't, uh, but it manifested itself in my military career many, many times. I mean, I jokingly, I say like, I've failed everything in the course of my life. Like I've, I've failed enough things to figure out how to be successful. And I, I don't know where that, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's my family, maybe it's in the genes, but, um, you know, I just never. I never listened to people. I never listened to opinion. If someone told me I couldn't do something, if anything, it was more of a motivator to go do that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I probably didn't answer your question there. No, but. yeah, no, that makes total sense. I mean, I, I feel like you're a very humble guy and saying you failed everything is, is maybe uh, sub pretty subjective here. <laughs> Others would look at what you've done differently, but I, I hear what you're saying. Just as oh no, wait, wait till we keep talking. I'll tell you all the times that I failed and got fired. No, they okay. exist. 
Um, just out of curiosity, when you grow up in Delaware, what is the pro baseball team that you follow? Uh, it's kind of split. So if you're, it's, it's almost like the Mason Dixon line in Dover. So can't there's three counties in the state of Delaware. Dover is right in the middle in Dover kind of North. They're all Philly fans. Um, mm-hmm. Dover South, they're all Orioles fans. And ironically, it's, it's almost equidistance if you live in the center of the state to go to Philadelphia or to go to Baltimore, I actually, I actually grew up both. Um, I was a Philly fan when I was young, young. Um, and that stayed with me. And then as I became a teenager and things like that, um, I had an uncle that lived in, uh, in, in the Maryland area that had season tickets to the Orioles. And my dad and I used to go over to Orioles games all the time. So I fell in love with the O's. You know, I was a giant Cal Ripken fan and all that stuff back in the awesome. Brady. Yeah. Brady Anderson, Cal Ripken, Robbie Alomar days like, uh, yeah. So giant baseball fan, man. But I honestly, I still, to this day, I split time. If one of them is doing bad, I ignore it and pretend like I'm not a fan, but, <laughs> but, the, but if, but the year the Phillies won the world series, the last time I, I tell you, I was the happiest person on the face of the earth. That's <clears throat> awesome. I just like the past couple of days, I'll be sitting here eating lunch and I'll put on the little league world series. And my wife is like, what the hell are you doing? It's like kids playing. I was like, nah, it's good. I'll watch this any day. I went to baseball camp in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Really? Yeah. And, and so you would, you would, I forget how, I think it was two weeks or whatever, but you know, you would go do drills on the alternate ball fields all day. And then in the afternoons you would go do like scrimmages and stuff in the world series stadium. And it was the coolest thing ever. Like I, that was one of the coolest times I've ever had. Uh, they did a phenomenal job. I don't know. I don't know if they still do it, but it was a, it was a really big deal when I was a kid to go there. And it was one of the coolest things I ever did baseball wise as yeah. a child. Oh man. Was that like, it must've been like your own field of dreams. Dude. It really was. That's what it felt like. You yeah. felt like a professional athlete as a 12 year old or whatever I was then. Um, yeah, it was awesome. God. All right. That's cool. Okay. So, so you're in high school, you decide you're committing. Uh, did you just walk down to the recruiting office or what, like, how did you find your way into the military? Yeah, I, I, I went, they had a combined recruiting station. I went to the recruiter's office. Um, I had done my homework. Like I said, I had, had a buddy that literally handed me like the CCT pipeline. <laughs> and so I, you know, I, I, you can only do so much research back then. We didn't have the internet, right. Yeah. You can look stuff up. So like, pamphlets and books and like word of mouth is all you had. So yeah, I went, I went to the joint recruiting station and, and I went to see the army guys originally. Um, and I said, I want to be an army ranger. And, uh, the guy that I got didn't really know a lot about the program, no, nothing against him, but he, that wasn't his background. Um, and he kept trying to pitch me other stuff, like being a logistician, being this, being that. And I really wasn't interested. It kind of put me off. Um, so then I went, you know, to the air force and I said, I want to be a combat controller. And the guy, same thing, knew nothing about it. He was like, well, yeah, yeah, you can, you have to sign up for another job or whatever. And because if that doesn't work out, you have to have a career in the air force. And I was like, so if I get injured, I end up doing whatever. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, eh, I don't know about that. And, you know, they all kind of throw their, I think at the time it was like Montgomery GI bill and the, or that was the army, but, and they had like some college money and some other stuff. And I thought this won't be bad. I'll do it for four years. I'll get out and it'll help pay for school. But yeah, the air force guy didn't have anything. So then I went to the Navy and I told the guy, I want to be a Navy seal. (laughs) And he, same thing. He knew nothing about it. You know, he was like, yeah, you can, you can do that. You can volunteer to go to buds when you're in Naval basic training um, but you have to pick another career field. And so that kind of put me off. And then I went to the Marines and this is after listening to all of those yeah, guys. So you made the rounds. I did. And, and I was like, I want to be a recon Marine. And the guy was like, well, you need to start out as an infantryman, you know, and they're going to, you know, this, 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 this. And I was like that, that, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Um, and he, you know, he's, the Marine was probably the most squared away of all of the recruiters. I mean, the guy looked apart. He looked like a Marine. He was a big barrel chested dude, you know, whatever high and tight or flat top or whatever Marines do. And sorry, that's probably, I probably just pissed one off, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like he, he looked the part, he looked like a, a barrel chested freedom fighter. And I was like, that's pretty cool. And so he, he gave me his whole spiel and he got done and I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I was like, I was like, but I gotta be honest, like all the other services are offering other things like college money or this or that, um, you know, like signing bonus, whatever it was, it wasn't a whole lot back in 1995 compared to the stuff they do now, but, 
but he goes, uh, or 94 actually was the year. And he goes, I said, so what's the Marine Corps going to give me? And he said, we're going to give you the privilege of being a United States Marine, son. See your reaction? That's exactly what I did at 17 years old. I laughed and he threw me out of his office. <laughs> Love it. Literally, literally he, he said, you can go. And I was like, what? And I was like, I'm, I'm sorry. And he was like, no, he's like, you can go. And I got up and I left. And so as I was leaving, um, one of the army recruiters, not a guy that I'd talked to ran out and I, I've told this story before, but, um, the guy's name was Corey Dio. I have no problem saying it. Cause he was a phenomenal dude. And, and Corey ran out and he grabbed me and he was like, Hey man, he's like, you got a second. I said, uh, you know, and I was really c- kind of let down cause I really wanted to do this. And I just didn't hear the things that I thought I was gonna. And Corey said, you know, I listened to your conversation in the office. He said, we're broken up by school. So technically I'm not allowed to talk to you um, because we have quotas and like whatever, whatever he said about, I'm not supposed to talk to you because you're not in my school district. Um, he said, I heard you. I understand. He's like, I, I'm not, I wasn't a ranger, but I, I was a paratrooper, 82nd airborne. He's like, proud of it. Jumped into Panama. He's like, I, I got you, man. He's like, will you give me five minutes? Let me go talk to my boss and make sure I can talk to you. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. And so he, he goes back in talks to the, whatever his station chief or whatever, and comes back out. He's like, Hey, come on back in. Um, he pulled up the army ranger video, uh, and showed me. Um, and I asked him, I was like, well, how do I do that? Um, and he said, yeah, they have airborne ranger contracts. Uh, and it turned out they didn't have a ranger contract available. Um, but they, they, did have a guaranteed airborne contract. And he said, when you go to airborne school, you can volunteer to go to the Rangers. Um, He's like, but at least you're airborne qualified and you're an infantryman, which is what you want to do. And he said, you know, we can get you going. And kind of the rest was history. So he he, guy was totally, totally honest with me. totally straightforward, super motivated, like God bless him. Um, I probably would have not ended up in the military if it weren't for that guy. Man, I I love moments like that. So Again, like that guy probably had no zero benefit from that, right? From a quota system. Nope. He, he yeah, it did, not it, it probably that. didn't help him at all. No. He out of the kindness of his heart, because of the things he heard me say, he just thought this dude would be a good addition to the United States Army. So, so Chris, like I don't know, it's impossible to know the answer to this, but like what if you left at there, that guy doesn't come running out. Like, where do you think your life goes at that I, point, man? I, I don't even know, man. Like I I didn't uh you know, I wasn't a dumb kid. I was an intelligent kid, but, but I didn't have the grades. Like I probably would have gone to community college and I don't know, played some kind of ball and I, who knows, man. Wow. I, 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 I mean, I might, I might still be in Delaware working, working a nine to five, doing something I hate. I, I, I have no idea, but yeah, that one guy, I mean, it happened to me several times throughout my career where just the, the goodness of one individual and somebody being selfless changed my life. Um, yeah. And it, I, I carry it around this day. Like I, like I, I try to be that with people. I try to be the person that, that just might say the thing that you need to hear that day because I've had that happen to me so many times. That's cool, man. God. All right. Okay. So, so you, you finally join up, um, you go in, through airborne. I know you, you've talked about this extensively, so I, I don't want to make you belabor it, but, um, a, as you joined up, how long do you end up spending, um, on, on the Ranger side? I know you move over to the green berets. Um, maybe the, just the first question here would be, was this your goal all along to find Delta or was it just, Hey, I, I got to get my foot in the door and see what things are available. Yeah. I don't think I knew a ton about you know, the special mission unit world. When I enlisted, I knew about army Rangers. I knew about green berets, at least on the army side. Um, I knew that I wanted to be an army ranger. Like that was all I ever, like, that was my goal. That was my initial thing was that is, that's awesome. These guys are highly trained. Like if we have to go fight for our country, these are the first dudes that they're going to call on. Um, like that meant something to me. Uh, I think as I went along, you, you, garner more information um when you're a kid in regiment um and it was rare then but occasionally unit guys would be down uh or you would do something in conjunction with them and back then it wasn't as close a relationship so it would be like you're gonna jump in and do an airfield seizure 
And then once you've secured the airhead, these dudes are going to fly in on the helicopters and land on this target. And you're never going to see them. You're just going to hear a bunch of booms and bangs. And then the helicopters are going to leave 30 seconds later. And those badasses are going to be off with what's really important here. So just make sure you do what you're supposed to do. And they build this lore. Um, so as a young ranger, like you see that guy and you just think they're a superhero. Amazingly, when you're young, it's like you only ever see the guy that Hollywood expects you to see. Like the like the 6'2", like Adonis build guy that just looks like an operator. The reality is, is they're all regular dudes like me and you. And while there are those guys, like that is not like the precursor to do things like that is not being a physical beast. It's part of it, but it's it's not really what it's about. So, yeah, I think I think there was a lot of things that built it along the way. But I always wanted to be I always wanted to be in that in that top tier. I always wanted to do the thing, you know, growing up as a baseball player, you know, your goal was to make the all star squad. Right. Your goal was to play outside of your bubble. And the only way you could do that was to be the best at what you did and to move on to all stars and then be able to go compete outside of that realm. And I think that just carried on. I, I just wanted to be a part of the top tier of whatever it was that I was doing. And I, and I wasn't going to stop until I got there. Based on the timing you described, were there guys in your unit who had been in Moog during uh, the Black Hawk Down type work? Yeah, I, my I, first unit... For sure. My first unit was, was, um, third ranger battalion. Uh, I wasn't there very long. I, I ended up getting a DUI as a young ranger. And, and at the time, if you got an alcohol related incident, you had to leave. So I was only there for like 18 months. Um, but when I got there, that was 1995, 1996. Um, and I was in Charlie company 375. So BCO 375 is historic for the Mogadishu mile and all the stuff that went down in Somalia. And so all those guys were still there um, to boot at that time in the mid nineties, you had guys in third ranger battalion that had, you know, two mustard stains. Um, they had a, they had a, you know, a combat jump star on their jump wings from Grenada and Panama. Uh, so there was a lot of, in your mind, then there was a, all this combat experience. There was all these guys that had been there, done that. Um, so if anything, I think it made you pay a lot more attention and listen to their guidance, um, because those guys had actually done some stuff in another otherwise peacetime stretch of time. Yeah. Oh man, that's interesting. So, so you mentioned the DUI, I, I'm probably going to try to keep a tally here. As you said that you failed everything. Oh, I missed I, one. You missed oh, one. Okay. So, you got another. All right. So when I went to the Ranger indoctrination program, uh, they did a, they did a, we didn't have cell phones then. Right. So you had to write down the number of where you were going to be on the weekend. And it was only three weeks long. So you only had two weekends in the middle and they, they brief you on the regimentals deployment policy. And if you're on ready force one or whatever, and you get called out, you have to be in and anywhere in the world in 18 hours or less. So they tell you at any point on the weekend, you could be called back in while well, I, because I was who I was, they said, don't go outside of an hour radius or whatever. Well, I drove to Clemson, South Carolina, because I had a bunch of friends in Clemson University, and I thought it would be fun to go party with them. And lo and behold, on a weekend that I did that, they did a recall. And there was a bunch of us. There was like, I don't know, 10 or 11 of us. Um, and I thought, I, I thought that's it. I'm going to go back out to the regular army. They actually didn't. They, they made us do RIP again. So they recycled us. Um, so I actually did it twice. Uh, thankfully... But, um, yeah, so that was the first I stepped on it and I got basically fired and I got told you got to do this again. And I went back and did it. So then, yeah. So then fast forward to now 18 months in the range regiment. Um, yeah, I had a buddy that got a, a dear John letter from his girl back in Texas and, you know, he'd been away a long time and, and, uh, wanted to go out and have a few beers. And, you know, at the time it really wasn't a big deal. If you're old enough to fight for your country, you're old enough to have a beer, just don't get caught was kind of the philosophy. Um, but at the same time, if you had an alcohol related incident, the policy was that you were leaving the regiment. Uh, and so we went out and had a couple of beers. I literally had two beers. Um, he had a bunch and I was driving him home and it had just rained and a car stopped on a yellow light and I hit the brakes and slid into the back of him. Uh, and because there was an accident involved and my buddy was obviously drunk, um, they were going to do a sobriety test 
Uh, the cop advised me, look, you're underage, just refuse it. He's like, it's an admission of guilt, but you can have a lawyer plead dumb, blah, 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 blah. You know, the games that they play, uh, it didn't matter. They took me back to the station. They did a blood test. I had alcohol in my system, even though I wasn't over the legal limit, I was underage. So anything in your system is yeah, considered yeah. a DUI. Um, so I was charged with a DUI. Uh, and, and yeah, I spent about another six months there. Um, we actually did a deployment to Germany and a whole bunch. I did a bunch of good stuff after that happened, but, um, but I was leaving. Yeah. So my, my, the joke of it was my, my section sergeant got a DUI the same night we weren't together, but, um, so there was no way I wasn't leaving the regiment. They were going to make a statement out of the two of us. So, so yeah, I ended up leaving after about 18 months. It crushed me. Um, was probably the first and worst thing that had ever happened to me because it's all I wanted to do. And I was so happy about being there and I loved it. I love what we did every day. I look back now and I laugh. I'm like, it was like a frat house at night. Like, I mean, it was like fighting each other and drinking and, and then you'd wake up at 4am and be outside in formation and go run six miles as fast as humanly possible, you know, but you were 18, 19 years old. Like that was, that was just what you did at the time. So it was a hard lesson. Um, it was a good lesson, but that 18 months that I got exposure in regiment right then and there was kind of key to a lot of things that happened later on in my career. And I, I didn't know it then, but I realized it years later. So I don't want to lose that thread. I mean, and I joined, you know, I, I commissioned in 02, so I wasn't there in the nineties, but I do, you know, I'm familiar with how difficult it was, this zero defect mentality. And you would think a DUI would sink your career, but certainly as it's happening, how, how did you come back from that? Uh, <laughs> it took a few years. Um, so I, I left there and I was actually an 11 Charlie. Um, I was a mortar guy. Um, so I was assigned a weapons platoon in 375. Um, because I was an 11 Charlie, which turned out to work in my favor, when you leave the regiment like that, when you get fired and leave, um, they call it worldwide assignment, meaning needs of the army. They can send you anywhere. And honestly, most dudes that get RFS like that, you end up in a shitty place like Fort Riley, Kansas or something like that. Um, I actually stayed on Fort Benning, um, because I was an 11 Charlie, they sent me to Kelly Hill, which there was one brigade of third infantry division that was on Kelly Hill on Fort Benning. Um, and they sent me to Kelly Hill because I was an 11 Charlie and they had a, uh, like a heavy mortar platoon in that, in the, one of the battalions in the brigade. Um, and so, yeah, I went to Kelly Hill, um, right there on Fort Benning. So I didn't have to actually leave and go anywhere. I stayed in the same spot, but I mean, you want to talk about a culture change, you know, going from regiment after 18 months and then, you know, being a airborne ranger and then moving to mechanized infantry. Um, that was a, uh, that was an interesting transition. Damn. And then how, how do you find your way out? I, I assume next you go, you go to selection for SF no. or no, no do you actually, come back? So, so I'm, you know, I had a four year enlistment. Um, so whatever, basic training, airborne, all the stuff that happened and then regiment and the time in regiment. And then I leave. So I get the third ID and I had, I don't know, a couple of years left on my initial enlistment. Um, we did a deployment to Kuwait. It was Operation Desert Thunder. So it was post first Gulf War when we were still patrolling the skies above Iraq. Um, and we would do these deployments to Kuwait as like a show of force. So they were constantly maneuvering forces in Kuwait, kind of just to keep the Iraqis paying attention that they, we, we got an eye on you. Um, that was awesome. That was a really good deployment. Like as a, as a mortar guy, as 11 Charlie, like we went over there and we had all of the ordnance that they had built up from the first Gulf war that was just sitting in Kuwait. So we did live fires like every two days. Um, I look back now and I'm like, okay, I shot, you know, a hundred thousand four deuce mortar rounds. That's probably contributing to my traumatic brain injury later on in life. But, but it was, but it was awesome as a soldier. So that was cool. I had some good leaders in that unit. Um, we had good, good soldiers and bad soldiers. It was just very, very different. Uh, and I learned a lot. They, I, I progressed really fast in that platoon because I was hungry and I was motivated because I was pissed off that I left the regiment, yeah, yeah. but I was going to get out. And, um, so two years went by 
And I was coming up on the end of my enlistment and I literally was going to get out of the army. I was like, you know what? I'm going to get out. I'm going to use this GI bill and college fund, whatever. And I'm going to, I'm going to go to school. Um, maybe I can get back and play baseball. I don't know, but that's literally where my head was. And I had a conversation with my platoon sergeant and he kind of ran it up the chain. And like I said, I, I was a, I was a good trooper. Like the DUI stung me and I, I'm not saying I was perfect. I still did dumb young kid stuff, but, but I was a good soldier and a quick learner and motivated and good at PT. And, and so he came back to me and he's like, Hey, the uh, battalion commander wants to talk to you. And I, I was like, what? Like battalion commander doesn't talk to at the time. I think I was like corporal Van Zandt or whatever. Um, and maybe they'd put E5 on me. I don't know, but I, I was young and I was like, why would he want to talk to me? And they, he wants to talk to you about staying in the service. So I had to go down to the battalion commander's office I, I'd never met the guy. Um, the guy's name was Colonel Lee. Um, but clearly he had had a lot of conversations with my chain of command and he said a lot of nice things, said a lot of good things about the service. <clears throat> and he basically asked me like, what do I need to do to get you to stay in the army? And I was like, sir, I don't know that you can do anything. You know, why do you want me to stay? I said, look, I got a, I got a DUI in my first enlistment, like I got a, a general letter of reprimand. Like, I, like I had this, I'm literally Winnie the Pooh. I got this, or Eeyore, I got this dark cloud that follows me everywhere. And I said, I just don't know that I can overcome that. And that's not what I had in mind. Like, I don't always want to be living out from under the rock. And he said, well, what if I can make that go away? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, I can't make it disappear. He's like, but I can move it to your restricted fish. He's like, you got it as a young kid. It's like kids make mistakes. You're not, you know, it's not going to haunt you the rest of your career. It's not going to slow down promotion. Like you'll be fine. And I was like, well, that's interesting. Like if you could really do that, sir, I would consider staying. And I said, but I'm not staying here <laughs> to the battalion commander. And he, to his credit, he, he took it in stride and he was like, no, I get it. He's like, you started out in the Ranger regiment and you came to a mechanized infantry battalion he's like that's a big change of pace i said i said no offense sir i've had a great time here as it's been awesome i've enjoyed it i go but it's not what i signed up to do and he said well where would you be happier and i said well i at least want to get back to jumping out of planes because i really enjoyed that and he's like well you know what about the 82nd at fort bragg and i said yeah that that would that would definitely do it he's like all right well if i can move that letter of reprimand would you be willing to re-enlist if if we can send you up to the 82nd and i said yes sir i will Damn. So that's Damn. another, another guy who kind of went out of his way to just Changed keep it. Yep. No reason to do it. I mean, yeah. w- just one guy in his battalion and he took the time to do that. And it, it made a huge impact on my life and a huge difference in my life. And it made me feel like I made a mistake and I can recover from it. Like it was a really good lesson of just stick it out, man. Like stay resilient, like keep fighting, keep doing the right thing. It's okay. You screwed up get over it and don't do it again. Uh, and people will look out for you if you work hard. And I, it, it, it really was, it was a huge moment. Man. Okay. So, so then what happens next? You get to the 82nd and are we talking like, are we 2000 now? Mm. This is now 1999. Okay. Um, so I went to second three, two, five, um, in the 82nd. Um, so I was back jumping out of planes. I immediately, I was an E5. So I immediately took over a mortar section in a line company, um, which was another kind of cool moment. Um, the mortar section in a line company, you know, it's usually an E5 promotable or an E6 and it's in charge. You got two gun teams. So you got three or four guys on each gun team. You're a small element within this infantry company and you answer to the company commander so as the section sergeant, you're like, you're like a platoon leader and a platoon sergeant at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, you got to go to the first sergeant meetings as an NCO and you got to go to the, the COs meetings as a platoon leader because you're your own element. Uh, and it was cool. They, you know, I love to train. I love to train the guys and we spent shit five days a week in the woods. Like I love, I love that stuff. Um, I enjoyed my time there, had some great people around me. Um, I used to befriend the, the new lieutenants that would come in because I shared the command company CP, the command post with them. So I had a desk in the same place with all the new platoon leaders. Um, so I was like the one NCO, you know, they had their platoon sergeant that treated them like they were idiots. 
And then you had, you know, Sergeant Van Zant that was a E five P that was cool to all of them. Cause I'm like, ah, they're new guys. Like uh, somebody has got to take them under their wings. And, uh, and I met a Lieutenant, I met a Lieutenant um, guy by the name of Paul Karen uh, that came in and he was a West pointer. Um, I wasn't a West pointer fan uh, up until then. Um, there was just a difference between guys that came out of ROTC guys that were prior service and, and West pointers. And, um, and Paul changed that. He was, he was a boy scout through and through. He's a little odd. Um, but he was brilliant. I mean, he was a super cerebral guy and he was one of those people that just seemed to know a lot about a lot. Uh, and I didn't know why, but I liked it. And so we got to be friends and, um, I think a year and a half or so went by, uh, and they wanted to move me to HHC to take over a section in the 81 platoon, which was at headquarters, headquarters company. So you had sixties in the line companies, you had 81s at headquarters company that supported the entire battalion. And honestly, I had learned so much in my time as 11 Charlie with the Kuwait deployment and moving up and all those things. I was already doing fire direction control. Like I had all that stuff kind of mastered really what was left for me was like leadership roles, like being a section sergeant, being a platoon sergeant, there was no more learning involved. I was an infantry mortarman and I was bored. Yeah. And, uh, and so Paul, you know, the platoon leader, he ended up getting a second platoon he because he was a rock star he moved and took the scout platoon um so he had a line company platoon then he took the scout platoon and i knew paul was going to be one of those o's that went to regiment like when he left the 82nd like that was his path he was going to end up an sf officer in some form or fashion and you know paul said to me um hey i'm going over to take scout platoon why don't you come with me and i was like i'm an 11 charlie like they're all um, those are 11 bravo victor slots like they're 11 bravo ranger slots I can't go do that. And he was like, yeah, you can. He's like, I'm, I'm the platoon leader. I can recommend whatever I want. And he's like, you know, you're as good at individual seven dash eight tactics as any line squad leader that I've ever worked with. He's like, if I ask for it, they're going to give it to me. He's like, they all know who you are. Like you're a performer. Um, and I was like, well, how do I do it as Lemon Charlie? He was like, just reclass. And I'm like, what is that? And he's like, it's where you just change your MOS. And I was like, how do you do that? He's like, go see the reenlistment limit. Again, how does this guy know all this as a brand new lieutenant? (laughs) And, you know, I'm I'm self-absorbed and I don't even pay attention to all that stuff. You're, you know, I figured it out after the fact, but, but yeah, so I did. um, And the commander and first sergeant signed off on it. They reclassed me to 11 Bravo. I was promoted E6 the day after they did that because of where points fell. Mm -hmm. Um, so as, as a E5 P 11, Charlie points were at the top of the totem pole and nobody was getting promoted, but as a E5 P 11 Bravo points were way down here. So as soon as I reclassed, I was immediately promoted to E6. I moved to the scout platoon the next day and took a team, um, under Paul's command in the scout platoon. And, uh, and yeah, so we did some fun things there. And then, um, he actually had a conversation with me at one point about, you know, what my next course of action was. And I said, I wanted to go to SFAS. I want to go to green beret, beret selection. And he said, is that what you ultimately want to do is be a green beret? And I said, no. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a special mission unit operator. I said, I want to be a Delta force operator. And he was like, well, why don't you go do that? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm 23 years old. Like they don't take dudes like me. I have no combat experience. You know, I had all these preconceived notions. Um, and he said, well, that's bullshit. And I was like, what do you mean? And he like, showed me like the requirements and he's like, you have to have minimum of four years of service. You have to be 22 years of age, whatever they were at the time. And I was like, wow. And he's like, yeah, he's like, so if you, you know, you go take the test, PT tests and do all the things they asked you to do and they invite you to attend selection. He's like, if it doesn't work out, so what? Then you go to SFAS. If it does work out, then you end up where you really want to be and you don't waste that time doing something else. Didn't know why he was saying that. Um, as it turns out, uh, he, his father was the unit Sergeant major at the time. No way. Yeah. And I, I didn't know that. Um, I I like swear on my life, no clue. How would I, all he ever said was his dad was a 12 Bravo was a combat engineer. And he was a combat engineer because you can have any OMOS and go to the army special mission unit, but he never told me anything else. And so one day we were coming back from setting up some training and he said, Hey, do you mind if we stop in and see my dad? And I said, no, that's no problem at all. And he turns on to Lamont off McKellar's road. And I'm like, where are you going? 
And that was when the compound was more easily accessible, but it was still a compound. And he pulled up to the gate and I was like, dude, what, this is the unit compound. And he goes, yeah, he goes, we're going to see my dad. I told you. And I go, you told me your dad was a combat engineer. He goes, he is. He's a 12 Bravo. I go, well, what does he do? He goes, oh, he's the unit sergeant major. <laughs> Jesus, man. No, I don't know to this day if like that was a joke that Paul played on me or <laughs> what. Um, but yeah, so he took me in to meet his dad. It was kind of a funny conversation. He didn't say anything positive or negative. Uh, he just, you know, told me good luck. Um, I just wanted to get out of there. Uh, and yeah, so I went to selection that fall. Uh, I didn't make it. Okay. <laughs> so what is that? Three, <laughs> Check. Got it. uh, you know, I made it all the way to like the last thing, um, that you have to do. And I, I got chopped on a day that, that a lot of people get chopped and they don't tell you a whole lot failure to meet the time standard, but they asked me to come back. Um, and I did, and I was successful the second time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was all again because of one person taking the time to, I don't know, do something for me for yeah. no reason, no reason at all, and it changed my life. So I, I want to talk about the second time through, but before, I mean, I feel like you've got a little Forrest Gump in you here, where like these for two minutes. I'm, I'm slow. No, I'm not saying. <laughs> But th these these encounters you have, and I wonder, again, I know you're very humble, but it, do you feel like you might be more open to people's advice? Like how, I, I think there are a lot of times in life where you could come up with this, you, you might run into somebody who could help you. Like maybe there's a little bit of you helping yourself there as well along the way, maybe even under the radar. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I... I was just telling somebody the story the other day when I, when I was in high school growing up, <clears throat> I had teachers that, that loved me and teachers that hated me. Um, but I had one that stood out. Her name was Kathy Morris and she was a marketing teacher in high school. She taught marketing one and two. And I enjoyed that. Right. It was like, how do you appeal to the masses to get them to do something that you want? And I did really good in that class. Um, it covered a ton of subjects, but mainly it was because she was a really good teacher and I really liked her. Like she was interesting. She was entertaining. She was down to earth. She was just a good teacher. And she said to me, um, the year that I graduated, she said, you know what? You're going to be successful at whatever you do. And no adult had ever said that to me. And I had made a lot of mistakes. I was a kid that got in trouble quite a bit. Like no one had ever pulled. I mean, your parents, of course, say positive things, but no other adult had ever said something like that to me. And, and Miss Morris did. And she said, you're going to be successful at whatever you do. And I said, why do you say that? And she said, because you're a really good bullshitter. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, what? And she goes, no. She goes, it takes an incredible amount of intelligence to be a really good bullshitter. And bullshitters are successful because they know how to continue to push and excel and get to where they need to be. And she said, so whatever direction you choose to go, just know you're, you're going to be successful at it. And frankly, that stuck with me. Like, it didn't matter if people said the bullshitter thing I say is a joke and, and she did too. Like she was being funny cause I was a little asshole, but, but it stuck with me that, you know what, if you put your mind to something, it doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter how, how big you are, or how physically fit you are, or how intelligent you are. If you put your mind to it, you can achieve it. And honestly, man, for my senior year of high school, that stuck with me. So no matter how many times I got beat down, I felt like if I just, you know, put my boots back on and keep going, it'll work itself out. And it did. Okay. So you mentioned that you don't make it through selection the first time. How hard is it mentally to think like, I'm going to come back and do this again? Cause I've just heard it's so difficult. It, it wasn't for me. Um, I honestly, I, I felt like I was crushing it the first time I was good at land nav, like for whatever reason, I'm just, I mean, maybe it's why I like mountaineering and, and doing all the backcountry stuff now, like looking at a map and reading terrain and understanding it and navigating was just something that came to me and I enjoyed it. I enjoy maps. I collect maps to this day. I, I build my own when we do trips and I save them, but, but I was good at it. So I, I felt like I was fast. I felt like I was in shape. I felt like I was ready the first time. Honestly, when they sent me home, I felt like in my head, which isn't true. I probably didn't meet the time standard, which is an accurate statement, but I felt like they were just testing me. I felt like 
they're going to send me home because I'm 23 years old and they want to see if I'll do it again. Wow. And you know, who knows if that's true or not. Um, the unit is really, really good at screening and selecting folks and, and phenomenal at finding the right people for the job. But so I came back a year later and I was confident. Um, the only downside of that was in August. So this is August of 01. Um, I used to take my team, actually two teams out of the scout platoon. And believe it or not, we used to go play basketball in Ritz Epps gym there right on Fort Bragg. And I did it because we were constantly crushing dudes with road marches and PT. We did PT twice a day. It was like one day a week we would go over and we would play like five on five basketball. And it was fun. And I twisted an ankle, like high ankle sprain really bad in August of 2001. And I was due to go back to selection in, in the end of September, early October of 01. At the same time, I got levied in August to be a drill sergeant at Fort Benning, where I started out. So I was on orders to attend a drill instructor school and I had just sprained my ankle and I called the unit recruiter and I said, Hey, look, I just got orders that said, I got to go to, to drill sergeant school on this date. And it was pre-selection. And the guy said, don't worry about it. And I went, what? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm a soldier. I'm an NCO in the army and I have official orders that say, do this. And he said, send me a copy of that or however, I think I faxed it or whatever at the time, but however that happened, he said, don't worry about it. You're coming to selection. Don't sweat it. Um, so I, in that last like month that I had leading up, I learned how to tape my ankle, um, went back to my baseball days and your athletic trainer and, you know, looked up library books on how to properly tape an ankle. And I taped the shit out of my ankle so I could continue to train. And, uh, and then nine 11 happened. Um, sort of right in the weeks leading up to that. And, you know, that was, I was in the field and we got, we were in the middle of an exercise and we got called back to like the company CP. And I thought it was bullshit. I was like, why are they calling us in? I thought it was a test because we were out on a reconnaissance and surveillance mission. And I thought they were messing with us. And I had just gotten in a gunfight with op four or whatever. And, but we came back in and they said, yeah. Um, And the company commander briefed us and said, you know, a, a plane just hit one of the world trade centers. And that was before the Pentagon got hit. And then in the time that we went from the field, they load us on on buses. As soon as they could get them out, they brought us back to the company headquarters in that stretch of time was when the plane hit the Pentagon and and then the other tower. And so we were watching this all in the day room on TV and it was just, it was such a crazy like stretch of time. Like I'm on levy. I'm supposed to go back to selection. I'm on this bum wheel. And then, and then all this happens. And I thought, well, I'm not, I'm definitely not going to selection now. Like we're going to war. Like I'm going to get on a plane. This is the 82nd airborne. Like we're the premier airborne infantry, you know, unit in the army. And, and, um, but yeah, it, it drug on for two more weeks and lo and behold, I went to selection about two weeks later, um, found myself in West Virginia. And, uh, I, I mean, I was as motivated as a human being can be when I got there. Uh, is, is it odd for me to think you may not have been the greatest drill sergeant? You know, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. Nobody's ever said that. I think I would have been good. What do you mean? You Um, seem so mellow. Yeah. I mean, now years later, I I, I mean, when I was, when I was a corporal, when I was an E5, I was what you would expect. Um, Okay. I was a hard charging young NCO that did whatever people told me and pushed my guys to the limit. Uh, yeah, no, I think I would have been a good drill yeah. sergeant. No, I, I, I say it. that in jest. I would have hated it, but, but I think I would have been all right at it. Damn. Okay. So, so you do selection the second time, yeah. clearly you make it through when you finished that, did you feel like finally made it after all this time? I'm where yeah. I want to be. Definitely. I mean, it was, it was a really, really neat feeling. I mean, when you finish, uh, the end of selection, you know, the last event is a, is a 40 mile road march or whatever. Um, and when you get done, uh, you know, you get some handshakes and you're not used to that and people tell you congratulations. And then as sort of time goes by, as you're sitting there all pathetic, um, you realize that not a lot of guys finish this thing. 
Uh, and then, you know, a few faces show up um, and, and you're happy to see them. And it's that like mutual accomplishment thing that is probably one of the more incredible moments of my life. Like, you know, you're moving on to something bigger. You know, this is the next step. You know, you're only a millimeter of the way there. Um, but yeah, I definitely felt a sense of accomplishment. I felt a sense of redemption, like, like I, I stuck it out in spite of all the things that had happened. And, and now I'm finally moving on, hopefully to, to someplace that I really want to be. Wow. And so theoretically you're the first class post nine 11. Yeah. Yeah, we were, um, it was an interesting group. It was an interesting class. Um, there were a handful of guys that were on their second time there with me. Um, so I knew a few of the faces and it was a different mood. Um, guys were, there was not a lot of communication that went on, not that you can talk a lot anyway, but it was a very somber class. It was a very motivated class. Um, and yeah, I think we were, uh, you know, you feel really good, but at the same time, we were all really serious about what happens next. Wow. All right. Yeah. So please take me through what happens next. Like you, if, if we fast forward to the time you get into combat, um, what is that like the first time for you? Yeah. So I went through school. Um, I graduated the operator training course. Um, typically in the pipeline, you graduate the operator training course and then you move on to a couple other specialty schools, you know, like one of them being like military free fall. If you haven't already gone, um, I didn't even get to do that. Uh, I graduated the operator training course. I reported to my squadron. Um, my squadron was actually deployed at the time. Um, they were in Afghanistan. So this is now late spring, early summer of 02. Um, so some things have happened in Afghanistan that we were very aware of. Um, we knew that the unit had participated in Operation Gecko um, right post 9-11, um, that they were kind of the first statement that the U.S. made. Um, so, yeah, so I show up to squadron and, and there was an op sergeant that... Um, uh, received us and went through like kit issue and told us, you know, this is the team that you're going to be assigned to. You, we have about a week to get you guys ready and get some in-processing and stuff done. And then we're putting you on a plane on a rotator. Uh, you'll, you know, you'll fly into Oman um, and, and sit there for a couple of days and then you'll go from Oman to, uh, to Bagram and then uh, link up with your team. And that's exactly what I did. Um, so there really wasn't a whole lot of time to process or even think about anything. Uh, and then I found myself landing in Kabul and, um, being taken to the tents that everybody was living at the time. This is, you know, this is O2. So it was way before all that stuff was built out. Um, so the organization had a series of tents, um, that they were all living in and I went in and met my team for the first time, um, kind of in the middle of the night is when we arrived because they would only fly into Bagram in hours of darkness at the time. Um, and yeah. Um, I think my, my first, uh, my first mission, I think I did one training like iteration with the team somewhere there on Bagram and they were just feeling me out. And then literally within a week I was on target in Gardez, Afghanistan with a new team. Jeez. Is it sorry for the ignorant question here, but you know, coming out of, of OTC and this training pipeline, do you come out at a position where theoretically it's plug and play and, and it doesn't matter that you didn't train up with the team for eight months? Like you're interchangeable basically? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you, you come out of school. I mean, I was a, I was a young, motivated dude and I, just had a lot of success after overcoming a lot of obstacles. So, uh, you know, I was probably a little cocky in mentality at the time. And the very first, like I said, I got, I think I got one training run with the team. And the very first realization I had was, you know, I thought I was this lightning fast dude in, in, in the course, um, because you do get really good. It's repetition and, and you spend so many hours on the range and so many rounds and you do so many iterations, like you're, you're, you're a performer and then you get there and you realize that you're moving at like half speed compared to, to these guys. So it was an eye opener. Um, there was a lot of lessons learned just in the first few days with guys, like guys that you look at, 
like I never, I, I'm not a big guy. I, I think I, I had the same thing. I had the Hollywood impression of what an operator looked like. And that definitely wasn't me. So I was always humbled to be there. I was humbled when I showed up because of that. And then you look around and you go, yeah, you know, there's, yeah, there's some dudes like that, but there's a lot of guys that look like me. And then you do something with them um, and you start training with them or you do a hit with them and you realize, wow, these guys are fucking phenomenal. Like they are just really, really good at what they do. And I have a long way to go. And that's exactly how I felt on that first one. You know, if, if we could spend just a minute longer on this, that it, this has got to feel like if we, if we put it in context, timing wise, like this is the beginning of this war. And I mean, it's early, early on, even at the time, um, it's got to feel like you were called up from the minors and thrown into like a playoff game. Yeah. With a, a whole bunch of guys you never played with. And they're like, you better fucking hit man. Like you got to get on base. How, what was the, how much pressure did you feel at the time? Uh, you know, I had some really good teammates. Um, I had, I had a couple guys that are lifelong friends that the, the guys on my team, um, were very, very good about being inclusive. They knew, um, they knew that I was joining them in combat. They knew that the next day we could be on target in a life or death situation. And I'm the guy on their left or the guy on their right. Like they knew they didn't have a choice, but to be inclusive, you couldn't be, there wasn't time for hazing at the team level. Yeah. So you got stuff from other people in the troop and the, you know, the troop sergeant major or whatever, like there was an element of hazing that went on, but the team was very inclusive. And those guys were quick on the draw, like, Hey, you need this. You need that. Hey, you're going to need this. You're going to need that. They were open to questions. Like they were really receptive. Uh, like I said, lifelong friends, guys that I still talk to to this day, that first team that I joined, um, I spent a lot of years in combat with, like we didn't change. And, and those dudes, you know, are probably part of the reason I'm still here today. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a great experience. Um, I felt like I evolved quickly. I got along with teammates, which is helpful. Uh, it doesn't always work that way for guys. Like you don't always click. I got, I got lucky. You know, one of the guys on the team was from Maryland. We hit it off right away. Like I'm from Delaware. You're from Maryland. We're like, we're like Chesapeake crab eaters. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, there was some kind of instant connection with a few of them. Um, but, uh, but yeah, all in all, it was a good experience. Afghanistan was a different time then too. Uh, you know, I think the squadron did like, I don't know, like nine or 10 ops, like legitimate ops during that first rotation that they were over there um, because things were slow. We were still developing the battlefield. We we're still developing targets and everybody went to ground, you know, post gecko when they knew we were coming, everybody went to ground and disappeared for a while. So it, it took a while to build those target packages. So it was a pretty slow rotation, which I'm thankful for. Yeah, um, but, but yeah, all in all, it was a, great experience. Can you take us through that first operation, you know, as much as you can say, but just like, what was the feeling like? Um, what, what type of opera you guys doing? What happened? Yeah. It, 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 we, we let, you know, in the community, we laugh at a low vis operation. Low vis meant I'm in civilian clothes and wearing my body armor, but we did it. We did a hit in, uh, in Gardez, Afghanistan, chasing some targets. And, um, if there's two things that stood out from that one was I made a fool of myself um, I didn't, you know, never being in Afghanistan, the facility that we did the dry run in, in, in Bagram was normal and was a regular building with regular doorways. When we did the hit in Gardez, we blew the breach and we entered the compound. The very first doorway I went into was an Afghan door, which is about here on me. And I'm only six feet tall. So under night vision, um, I, I don't even think we explosive breach. I think we manually entered the courtyard or, you know, manual breach, MOE breach. And went in and, and we went, ended up left in the first sort of room off the courtyard and just scalded myself, man. Like nods on the bridge of my nose, oh. broke them off my helmet. And in the room, I had to go to, you know, my tack light instead of my nods. And I got yelled at by like my team sergeant at the time. Like, what are you doing? Why are you using your tack light? Like, stay on nods. And he didn't know I ripped my nods off my face and was bleeding, um, which I'm not the only person that's ever happened to in an Afghan doorway for the first time. But. That was one. Two was after we were all secure, um, I ended up moving up to the rooftop with my team and we were providing some perimeter security from the rooftop. And there was a lot of stuff going on. There were alternate targets. Um, and my troop sergeant major was on the radio and he was the coolest cat I had ever heard on the radio. 
And I thought it was interesting because I, here I am in combat. There's all this stuff going on. But even in all of the training that I had ever done leading up to that point, I had never heard a guy so cool, calm and collected on the radio. And it stuck with me because it was significant. It was like, man, that's exactly how you want that guy to be. Like, if you got a dude yelling at you, you're just going to turn it off. You're not going to listen. And I, I did at various points later on in my career when people were like that. But, but Bill was the man and, and totally chill. And it kind of put you at ease. Like, you, you literally felt like you were surrounded by the best in the world. I wasn't, I wasn't scared in Afghanistan. Um, weirdly, I, I think I just felt so comfortable. And, and I believed so much in the talent of the people around me that I, I literally was not afraid at all. That stuff didn't happen until much later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And if, if we kind of jump to that later, it, tell me about your first time in Iraq, I guess. Yeah. So Afghanistan, we came back. Um, <clears throat> my squadron commander at the time is kind of the guy that solely sold the fact that we need to do a long range desert mobility into Iraq. Um, so when the the Army Special Mission Unit, when the unit was involved in the first Gulf War, they were scud hunting in the Western Desert. So they left out of RR Saudi Arabia. They drove across the Western, Western Desert and they were seeking out scud missiles. Um, so now you fast forward to, to the second Gulf War um, and he pitched it as a uh, long range desert mobility and that intelligence believed that if Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, whether they were nuclear, biological or chemical, that he was going to not store them in the major cities that they were going to be hidden out West in some of the ammo supply points and, and things like that. So he pitched that uh, concept um, and fought for it. And we ended up being the unit that did the, the desert mobility into Western Iraq. Um, so we're about three days before the air war. Um, and we again left out of our Saudi Arabia on in unarmored vehicles in, in six wheeled Penskowers um, as a squadron. Uh, and our goal was to basically disrupt, to hit all of the ammo supply points and various targets throughout the Western desert and work our way towards Tikrit, which is where they thought Saddam would flee to um, once the war started. So about three days before the air war began, uh, we left our R, we headed for the border. Um, we got snow, I think that first night in the desert, which, uh, you know, I was, I read a lot of books prior to getting the unit. And one of them I read was, was Andy, McNab Andy McNabb's book, uh, two, two SAS guy, Bravo two zero. Um, and you know, they were crossing the Western desert in the first Gulf war and they had, you know, had an engagement and ended up breaking contact and guys ended up eating and all over the place. But he talked about getting snow in the desert. And I remember reading it thinking, oh, that's not going to happen. And then here it was snowing on us. Um, but anyway, so a, a night goes by, we get to the border. Um, we ended up, uh, one of our mechanics, we had on satellite imagery, we had identified a bulldozer that was sitting near. They had these big berms um, on the border of Iraq and Saudi Arabia that you couldn't drive a vehicle over. They were, you know, 40 or 50 feet tall earthen berms that had been built however many years ago. And then periodically, you know, ever, every so many miles, they had these guard outposts with towers. And so the plan was um, we were going to have special operations aviation dudes on the army side. So 160th, hell, you're, you're, you're kin. Yep. Uh, we're going to take out the two outposts that were on either side of our crossing location. On imagery, we had seen that there was a bulldozer in the vicinity that we wanted to cross. So we headed for that site. Um, actually made a clever assumption that whether there were keys or not, that our mechanics could hotwire the bulldozer. And they did. Nice. Um, they used that bulldozer to plow a hole in the berm. Uh, and then round about the time that the, you know, helos were commencing the assault on the outpost, we crossed over that berm and into Iraq. That's awesome. Is it, I mean, we're only talking 10 years from Gulf War one. Were there, guys at the unit who participated in that? Like, was there institutional knowledge? Yeah. So weirdly um, in the, in the lead up to that invasion, because it was a desert mobility and that was, wasn't something that was very common. Um, the unit did something that very few units ever do. They went and found all of the vets from the first Gulf war. That's awesome. Um, so there were a handful of guys still in the building that had done the last one that were, it was B squadron at the time, but that had done the original mission they pulled all those guys in and they basically went through lessons learned and they said, all right, if we're going to do what we did then today, 
with all the assets that we have, how would we do it? And we kind of built a plan from there. Um, so all of our rehearsals and all that stuff, I mean, we came up with some unique equipment. We had some technology on our side this time that, that they didn't have then, you know, we had, we had ground-based FLIR balls mounted on, on a handful of the vehicles, which as you know, were only on aerial based platforms to that point and some ships. Right. So, um, we were the first unit ever to employ a ground-based FLIR ball and it was night and day difference on the battlefield. It gave us so much standoff to call close air support that, you know, they never knew we were there most of the time. God. And then to, if you could just, I mean, you've, you've been involved in so many operations, but could you take me through maybe one of the, the more memorable sets of ops that you were on that, that come to mind during the invasion or, or post that? <laughs> I think you can choose, uh, take it, take it however you'd like. But yeah, I, the ones I, that come it, to mind that you, you kind of remember for whatever reason. The invasion was was significant because it was a long range desert mobility, like very, very few times in history. And I'm a history buff. Has that ever happened? You know, it 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 harkened back to, you know, the the World War Two in North Africa yeah. uh, days. And that was unique. There were a lot of there was a lot of unique engagements, a lot of unique targets along the way um, that stand out to me. But honestly, that like the next phase of Iraq was probably the most fun. Um, Post invasion, you know, we we went home. Another squadron relieved us and kind of continued the work. They finished up some desert mobility stuff and then sort of transitioned into sustained daily ops, where they were working out of a, a singular location. And we were hunting deck of cards then, um, so they were you know, Ba'ath Party members, Iraqi military members, Saddam loyalists. Um, they were basically folks in Saddam's chain of command um, that uh, posed some significance. But all those guys, like, they wanted no part of the USA. Like, um, yeah, there were some gunfights and stuff during the invasion. There was some stuff that went down there that were fairly substantial. But once we started hunting deck of cards, you know, those guys basically rolled over. Uh, you, you know, you might end up in a gunfight once every 10 or 11, you know, combat ops. Um, and it was a lot of fun. We were doing a lot of land on the X stuff. We were doing a lot of stuff that we didn't do years later because it was frankly too dangerous. So, um, you know, we did things like, and, and one that stands out to me is like, we did a daylight half gaff. So you have a helo assault force and a ground assault force. And I know, you know, but <laughs> maybe everybody doesn't yeah, listen. No, doesn't. so gaff ground assault force. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, my team was a climbing team. Um, so we ended up on little birds, uh, a lot, um, versus Blackhawks. And we were doing a lot of, uh, you know, literally hover over the target and rope in if you couldn't land, it was very commando stuff. Um, and when you're, when you're a young guy like me, like getting to do all that stuff was just incredible. Like you didn't, like I said, I wasn't even scared back then. I, I was so excited about what I was doing that that stuff hadn't caught up to me yet. Uh, but there was a particular one. It was a daylight half gaff and it was pre Saddam capture. Uh, and we were, I was on the Hilo assault force on a little bird. And we took off out of where our location in Baghdad and we had to forward stage at a, at a forward operating base at a fob that the regular army had. And so the, because the gaff, the ground assault force was going to take, you know, twice the amount of time to cover the distance. Cause it was literally in downtown Baghdad and it was a multi-story building. And so we take off and we land at this fob and we get off. And now, so the U S army is established in Iraq. At this point, we have forward operating bases that are controlled by conventional units kind of all over Baghdad and, and, and you know, one in Fallujah, one in Ramadi. Uh, and, uh, so we land at this fob and we get off the birds and we're walking towards this building because basically we have about 35 minutes to kill. And this NCO, uh, the regular army runs up to us, to my team that's getting off the helo. And he says, you guys need to go over there to the clearing barrel and clear your weapons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I don't know what was said to the guy, whatever it was, it's probably not nice, but somebody said something to the effect of, do you see all the shit that I'm wearing? I'm in the middle of a combat operation. I'm not walking over there to go clear my weapon. Um, but uh, you know, 30 minutes or so went by, we loaded back up on the birds. Um, and again, this is relatively early on. And we, you know, we started the flight into downtown Baghdad, 
And I remember as we flared over the target building, seeing the charges go on the first floor from the ground assault floors. And I thought we are the greatest nation in the world. Like, what would you do if you were on the receiving end of this? You have helos full of commandos descending on you from above. You have vehicles full of commandos hitting you from the ground floor. Like how could anyone deal with this? And it stuck with me. There were a lot of those moments, but like that one in particular, because it was broad daylight, which didn't happen a lot. Um, and the timing was absolutely perfect. And I just thought there's nobody that does this, but us. And it really stayed with me. God. For those ops, you know, just talking to some of the, some of your coworkers, you know, as they describe uh, some of their previous ops, how, how dialed in they were. And as you describe it, right, like you're landing on the roof at the exact moment as a breach is going off down below. Um, were there some of those where you got, you came into an op thinking, all right, we're going to be in and out and it became a protracted battle. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, same rotation. Um, we were actually, no, this is later, uh, Halloween night. Um, so October 31st of 2002, no, three, 2003. So we caught Saddam in December of 03. So this is two months pre Saddam capture. Uh, we hit a target in Fallujah. It was a split target. Um, British SAS had one block. We had a block. Uh, we had Rangers in supporting roles and we had um, a, a cav unit that had Bradley's in blocking positions and the Brits um, advancing up the block. They got to about the fourth house in their block and went to breach the gate. The Brits at the time didn't do a lot of explosive breaching. They did MOE. They did manual entry stuff. So they used a lot of Halligan tools and stuff like that. And the, as they breached the gate to get into the courtyard, they took RPG and, and, and belt fed. Um, they ended up losing um, two guys that night. Um, and, you know, the gunfight that ensued, uh, you know, we helped them extract their casualties and, and, and get them in birds and off back to Baghdad for some care. Um, and then we sort of took over from that point. Um, and that was the first time we ever encountered foreign fighters. So that was pre Saddam capture. Uh, I'm fast forwarding, but at the end of that engagement, we ended up with a bunch of dead guys that, um, were literally in track suits, all in the same track suit and sneakers. And the house was full of nothing but guns and ammunition and, and like food and water. Um, and they were part of the initial rat lines coming in from the West. And that was the first time that it sort of dawned on us that, um, people are coming from other countries just to come kill us. Uh, this is definitely going to turn into something bigger than just hunting down Saddam and, and removing a dictator from power. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it got bigger and bigger as it went, but that night really stands out to me um, for a myriad of reasons. I, I, I watched some things go down. I watched some guys make some decisions that night in the midst of gunfire that, was the first time that I ever witnessed like what, what that's like, like when it's just your job to do that stuff every day and guys make those decisions, like that has an impact on you as a young soldier. And I was still even being in that organization, just watching those leaders make those choices. Um, I think affected me for the rest of my rotations, in, you know, during my career. How, um, you know, I know it's a somber experience, but, uh, with the SAS there, how much, um, trash talking goes on between those two organizations when you're not, not much so, so with two, two, not, not much. We had, we had a good working relationship. Um, that night was rough. Um, yeah. a couple of their mates, we didn't, um, you know, fortunately, um, uh, I, you know, a guy that's a longtime friend of mine now that's out of the service, uh, threw a grenade at me that night, a Brit, um, on a rooftop. I made the mistake of, of saying, you know, you never say the thing that you don't want something, someone to do. And I said, don't throw a grenade. And he said, right, frag out. Cause he thought I said, throw a grenade. Um, but no, the relationship between Tutu and the unit was always very good. We were pretty segregated at the time, but we, um, we cross pollinated training wise. So we were, you know, we had a bigger budget than them. We were at that point in those two organizations evolution, we were more advanced than they were. They didn't even have night vision when they first went into Iraq and they were Britain's premier tier one unit. Um, we were way advanced on them uh, or way advanced compared to them breaching wise. 
Um, so even though they were our legacy and they were where we came from and they were what our organization was built on, um, at some point, you know, in the late eighties, early nineties, we had surpassed them because of money and training and technology. Um, so we worked a lot with them on breaching stuff. Uh, frankly, those guys are a lot better at, at infill, exfill and some things like that. They just spent a lot more time on it. Um, so it was a very good working relationship between the two. Hi everyone. I hope you'll forgive me, but we're going to break here for part one. Chris has graciously given us a second session where we can dig into the second half of his story, which is very important because we've come off of this time, all of these deployments where he's living his dream. And the next step is a lot harder. So we're going to really spend a lot of time with him on what that was like, because it is a powerful story that we want to tell. I hope you'll forgive me for this, but I am really looking forward to round two. And I think we will all really enjoy that next session. Thanks so much for your support. Stay safe. Thanks for listening to this combat story. As we wrap up, I just wanted to say thank you to those in the combat story community who have taken a few minutes out of your busy lives to not just listen to these stories, but also leave positive and supportive comments on Apple and YouTube. Here are some of the comments that caught my eye this week. Our first comment today comes from Just Saying Today on YouTube. It says, this guy is incredible, so informative, so effing funny, and the interviewer is tremendous too. I want to know what the stuff is that he's drinking in that little six ounce glass. So this is a reference to uh, John Shrek McPhee. He's drinking out of something that he took off the battlefield, which is awesome. And he is drinking whiskey out of that. Our second comment comes from Apple Podcasts. It's someone who goes by the name Jetude L'Histoire. And he says, very informative. This podcast is both informative and interesting for a non-military person like myself. The chance to listen to two veterans discuss military life and battlefield experience is an honor as an American and outsider to this essential world. It cannot be easy to relive experiences that were potentially traumatic, but their vulnerability and willingness to share is a treasure to Americans who support our vets and know that freedom is not free. These men and women paid for it. Thanks so much for leaving these comments. I couldn't agree with you more. Looking forward to more to come. Y'all stay safe.